All right, we are in John chapter 7. We stopped at chapter or verse 31 last week. But, of course, you know, we, we kind of stopped in the middle of the story, so or in the middle of the narrative. So we need to kind of backtrack just a little bit. So there's a little recap. So Jesus has gone to Jerusalem, and it's during a particular festival. Who remembers what that festival is? Tabernacles. And what would they do for a week? The people who traveled there. They camp out. Essentially, they can't. They build their own, you know, makeshift hut, and they would camp out for the week, right? Um, and so, if you remember, they go there, and they're not quite to Jerusalem. And Jesus' brothers are like, "Why don't you go to Jerusalem?" And then we also talked about how Jesus would have gone to Jerusalem in secret, and that would be by not being in a crowd, not being with an entourage. They wouldn't. They wouldn't have noticed him. Uh, they were going to be looking for a large crowd. All the crowds followed Jesus. That's what they were looking for first. Without that, he, he got right on in. But he still went to the temple and he taught. And in that, we're, we're going to see some of the things that happened last week with their doubting of you know, the Messiah and we're not, we shouldn't know where he's from. That's going to come up again. And so that's the backtrack. And so we're picking up now... In John chapter 7, can I have somebody read verses 32 through 34? Just go ahead and read it when you get there. The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. All right, so verse 32 the Pharisees and chief priests, and the chief priests were, more often than not, they were Sadducees. They didn't get along. They didn't, they didn't work together well. Uh, but they both see Jesus as a problem, and so it's amazing how they come together and work together to try and arrest Jesus. Uh, it's ironic that people are more likely to unite in their hatred rather than their joy. There are, there are some significant doctrinal issues that there should be a split on. Paul even addresses this to the church in Corinth. He said there should be division because there's things that are unbiblical, that are not true, that we never taught you. That shouldn't be in the church. That makes sense. But in my experience, the vast majority of reasons why people leave a church or a church splits is not because of biblical reasons. We cannot unite in the joy of the gospel, but we can and will unite over dissension. It's amazing how well people work together when unified in dissension, but we just can't seem to be unified in the joy of the gospel. The greatest unity found in America is the church that functions through dissension. They seem to be on the same page there. Now, verses 33 through 34... There are three other verses which I think bring to light what Jesus is saying. And the reason why this is important is because it seems like in some places Jesus is saying you cannot come where I am going. And then in others he says you will or you can. And I think that needs to be clarified. And so there are two distinctions here. The first distinction is between believers and non-believers. John chapter 14, 2 through 4 says, In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also, and you know the, and you know the way where I am going. And so the first distinction is between believers and non-believers. Okay? That obviously non-believers cannot go where Jesus is, or where he is going. The second distinction is in Christ's mission. There are two verses where we see this happen. John chapter 13, in verse 33, he says, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. Sounds very similar to what Jesus just said. And he also alludes back to it. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. We see again in John 8, 21, he says, Then again he said to them, I go away, and you will seek me, 
and will die in your sin, where I am, uh, where I am going, you cannot come. So we, we see distinction of the believer and non-believer. The non-believer is not going to be able to go where Jesus is. The believer will. But the other is Christ's mission. What Jesus is about to do, none of us can do. Where he's about to go, to the cross, to the grave, to the right hand of the Father and right, we cannot go. But he does say, when I return, I will bring you with me, and you will be where I am. Right? So there's two distinctions, the believer and non-believer, and then also Christ's mission. We will take part in where he is as believers, but none of us were going to take part in what he came for. Does that make sense? And so what Jesus is saying in this one is the second distinction. Or actually, no, the first distinction. You cannot go. You cannot come after me. And he's saying this to the Jews. You can't come. Why? Because you don't believe. You don't believe, in, you don't believe who I am. You can't go. Does that, does that make sense? At face value, they might seem like contradictions, but they're not. Upon Jesus' ascension, um, we are given, the, we are given you know, the open door to the eternal life that we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, and so the first distinction is obviously between believers and non-believers, the second in his mission of salvation. Verses 35 through 36. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? And what did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot find me? <coughs> okay, so the Jews took this literally. They thought that Jesus uh, was going to go to another earthly location. They thought that Jesus was going to flee and then take the message to the Gentiles. Or take his message to the Gentile. They thought, oh, is he going to go where all the other Jews have been dispersed among the Greeks or among the Gentiles? And, and this, it, it's made very clear that with their thought of this, this goes back to how Jesus could not be the Messiah to them. One, why would he go to where pagans are? Why would he take a salvific message to pagans when certainly the Messiah wouldn't come to save Gentiles? He would only come for his people. That's what they interpreted it as, right? But the problem is, is we see yet again a willful ignorance when we get caught up in our own stereotype, I guess you could say, our own prejudice. Because Isaiah 49, 6 says, he says, it is, too small, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel I will also make you a light of the nation so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. He was always going to open the door to the Gentiles. He was always going to go after the rest of the world. Yes, in the Old Covenant, he singled out a people to separate them from the nations, to attest to who he was. He was always going after the Gentiles. And also, we talked about this with Egypt. There was never a door closed on any Egyptian who wanted to convert, but we also talked about what they were stepping into. If this whole God thing doesn't work, I'm willfully stepping into being a slave when this is all over. But that's the irony. Paul even says, Paul, a slave of Christ. He goes, I'll, I'll willfully step into being God's slave. It's much better than being man's slave. So this is why uh, they were upset with Jesus, especially when he ate with tax collectors and sinners, right? There's no way the Messiah would go to the Gentiles. There's no way he would do that. But his whole ministry was built upon that. His whole ministry, he was spending it with those who were overlooked by the Pharisees. So why are they surprised, especially when Scripture says, I'm opening, I'm not closing the door on the Gentiles. All right, so up to this point, we've, we've covered... One through three. Does anyone not have any answers there, or any who are who are filling in the blanks? Are there any that are blank for you? I'm all blank here. I'm sorry. No, you're good. All right. So number one, the the, the blanks are hatred and joy. Hatred and joy. And the last one is dissension. So hatred, joy, and dissension. Thank you. 
For number two, uh, 2A, it's believers and non-believers. 2B is Christ's, in Christ's mission. And number three is flee and Gentiles. They thought Jesus would flee and be among the Gentiles. Can somebody read 37 through 39? On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. I'm glad John inserted verse 39. Sometimes you have those passages that, you know, they clarify, and I'm thankful for that. Um, there's a context here that I was completely unaware of, which I found very interesting. So the context is, so Jesus is making this statement in light of a ceremonial practice that took place during the festival. So by this time in the fall, the water cisterns uh, would be near empty, and so the priest would need rain to refill them. It was very evident that rain was essential. And so this would be a part of their praying for rain. So after the fall, in the fall, obviously it's used up during the summer, and now they're a part of this process is they're asking God to, to, to bring rain. But there's a water ceremony which took place. So the seven-day water ceremony, on each one of the, of the seven days uh, prior to the final day, the priest would draw water from the pool of Siloam, and it would be carried in a golden pitcher full of water, and it would be carried to the temple. And around the altar, uh, the high priest would lead the way. And as the priest neared the water gate, they would sound the, uh, the shofar and, and blow the trumpet, and they would sing psalms of praise and thanksgiving and, and praise God for the harvest and also pray for him to bring rain. Now on the seventh day... They would do this, but on the seventh day, they would circle the altar seven times, similar to how they went around the walls of Jericho. And when he come, came around uh, for the sixth time, uh, he would then be joined with another priest carrying wine, and uh, the water and the wine would be poured on the altar. Okay, and obviously the altar would be lit, and so it would, you know, I wouldn't want to say burn up, but it would evaporate. You know, I guess that's a better way to say it. But that was... What would happen? It was a process of, of the ceremony, which I didn't know. And then Jesus says that all who come to me will not thirst, but that from him there will be springs of living water. This is the context. which Jesus, So Jesus is actually speaking in parallel to this water ceremony that would be taking place. And I think that that, that, I think that adds way more context to it than I ever would have imagined. But of course... John makes it clear that what Jesus, or who Jesus is speaking of is the Holy Spirit. And so John gives us the, an explanation, and in that we know the context, that he's speaking of the Holy Spirit coming. And in John 16, 7, Jesus says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him. Well, what's better than God walking among us? How about God indwelling us? The prophet Joel says in Joel, Joel chapter 2, uh, verses 28 through 29, he says, It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Will all mankind uh, include Gentiles? There we go. Um, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour my spirit in those days. And so Joel is prophesying of this. There's, a, there's another verse, two verses in Ezekiel that they, they prophesy of this, which is one of my favorite verses, and that's, I'll take from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He also says, I will pour my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. So there's a prophecy of a time to come where God is not going to dwell among his people, but that God is going to indwell his people. What's greater than God walking among us? God indwelling us. And so that's the prophecy that 
is, is being foretold by the, by the Old Testament. And Jesus is saying that that helper, that spirit, he's going to come. But in order to have him, what do you, we have to come to Christ. And it also elsewhere in Scripture, he says, it's better that I go so that you can receive the Holy Spirit. And any, of, any one of us who's working through our sanctification, we're certainly thankful we have him. Um, we're growing as people, growing better as, as husbands, wives, fathers, parents, grandparents, all that fun stuff. So, very thankful for that. Verse 44, 40 through 44. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priest. I'm sorry. <laughs> On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. So verse 40 through 41. It might seem confusing to us because... We read both of those names the same. The prophet spoken of by Moses and the Christ, in our understanding, is the same person. Jesus fulfills both. Uh, but the Jews saw them as two different people. You see that when uh, they're questioning John. Who are you? And they asked, are you, the, are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? So they saw this person as two different people. But as Christians looked back, we recognize that the prophet that Moses spoke of and the Christ, the Messiah, were the same. They were the same person being spoken of. But the Jews didn't see that. They saw that as two different, as two different people. So the prophet and Christ slash Messiah, we, we recognize as the same person. Was the, so the prophet wasn't John the Baptist? <coughs> no, but he was a prophet. He was a voice crying in the wilderness to make way. But when Moses sp spoke of them, it was... It's good, it's good that our English translation does this, but it capitalizes the P in prophet, which would have been a, a, a significant, rather than just a typical prophet. So, but John was a prophet. There's no doubt about it. He was the voice crying in the wilderness. But Moses was prophesying of the, what well, you say, the prophet, I guess you could say, the, the Messiah. Because where, where, I can't remember where we looked that up at. That was a while ago. Uh, going back to earlier in the chapter uh, from last week. So some discounted Jesus because of where he was born, right? But even clearly, they don't really know where Jesus is from. Because where was Jesus born? Exactly where they said the Messiah should have been born. So they're saying, how can, the, how can he be the Messiah because of this, this, and that? Well, they didn't even really know him anyway. They didn't even know where he was from, where he was born. What's that? I didn't know his ancestry. <laughs> didn't know his ancestry? Because if I'm not mistaken, it was Mary who was in the line of David, correct? Were both of them? Or I know Mary. They both were? Yeah. The one Matthew tracks through, like, saw a, through more like the, the divine, the king, the king, not the divine, the kings. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's, that well, is probably the Joseph's. Okay. Yeah, it was Joseph's. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the genealogies are always tough to read because they're always names you can't say. And yeah. I'm in a dad. Yeah. That name just made me think of somebody. I've been alive. Yeah, right. A lot of good names to name your daughters, but we passed up on that. What's the Bichette? What's your boy names? Verses 45 through 51. then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed him? But the crowd that does, that does not know the law is cursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing or learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. All right. So, seeing a lot of drama here. 
But up to this point, we've we've covered uh, one through five. So if there's any any blanks you have, let me know. Good talk. All right. So we're seeing. Well, one of the things we're certainly seeing here. What what when you heard what the Pharisees said and how they said it, what what kind of came to mind? I know there's a specific word I'm thinking of, but what are you seeing with the the conduct of the Pharisees and how they view the people? Elitist. Holy crap. Why don't you just pick the word I want? Contemptuous. So there's there's you see elitism, yeah. right? There there's this elitism within the the leaders. So the officers, they say that you know they were sent to arrest Jesus, but they didn't because they recognized that this Jesus is different. And I remember when I graduated from college, I was, ten, I was attending a church, and a congregant was, was teaching. And I didn't know this until afterwards, and I'll, I'll tell you about it. But apparent, he was very intimidated by me being in the class because I, I had a degree and so on. After the class, I approached him and told him what I learned the new thing that he, he taught that, that really helped me and how much I appreciated it. And then that was when he told me that he was really nervous about it because of this, this, and that. And so there was something I learned that day, and that was it doesn't matter how many degrees you have. It doesn't matter any of that. Um, God's word and God's depth is so much that even listening to a lay person with a degree, you're going to walk away from God's word learning something new. If you go into it thinking, oh, I've got this and this credential or whatever, you're not going to learn anything. That's, that's elitism. And, and I've, I've, been, I've been shown that countless times of, of just how God uses people because they're going to they're gonna see it from a different perspective that I otherwise didn't. And, and it's not contrary to Scripture, but it allows more depth to be shown. And so uh, it was a good experience for me, but also it was encouraging for him because it's like, don't, don't be... Don't be discouraged or, or intimidated by who's in the audience. Know that God is going to use you. Know that God will speak to his people, that, that you are a vessel for him, and don't, don't be intimidated by that. But one of the clear things we're seeing is the elitism in the leadership with the Pharisees. But you also see this elitism in the church. When a leader sees that they are above something, when they look down on their parishioners, when they think that they are something special... When an elder, pastor, shepherd, bishop, or a deacon, a servant, which is act, that's exactly what we are to be, leaders are to be servants of the church. When, they, when this happens and that elitism bleeds into the church, the church loses the heart of the gospel. So many times Jesus says the contrary. He says, if you want to be first, you have to be last. Well, what does that, what does that essentially do? It's going to change your heart. You can't, be, you can't desire to be first and be last. He's saying, I'm going to change your heart in this process, and you're not going to seek to be above someone else. Your desire to be above someone is to serve them, not to dictate over them, to control them. And that's what leadership is to be. And what we're seeing in the, in the church as a whole a lot in the American church is this elitism that the Pharisees shared in. That I'm better than it. This is above me. And I'll, and I'll commend to, you know, when I, when I first got here, we got here in January last year, so there was snow and ice and whatnot. And one of the things I noticed, apart from, you know, there being elders taking people to, to doctor's appointments and so on, is I saw an elder go out and start scraping the steps to get the ice off. That meant something to me. Because elders are supposed to be servants. And I saw that, and that was encouraging to me. That, that meant a lot. Now, so the Pharisees saw the crowds as ignorant, stupid, and yet all these so-called knowledgeable Pharisees, they couldn't see Jesus for who he was. Mark 8, 34 through 37 says, And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? This is why elitism does not belong in the church. If you're seeking to 
if you're aspiring to become an elder, Paul says that that is a noble call, but to do so for the purpose of trying to control and dictate things in the church, then you're losing this entire scope of the gospel. Then you're, you're losing the call itself. That's why the, the criteria for an elder is not, so who wants to do it? So, so who, who's most popular in the church? Who's been here the longest? It's who fits the qualification. The only real qualification that, that I see that, that might be an issue that I've seen come up is I've seen young people who fit the qualification, but the, they say, don't not a recent convert. And it's kind of funny because I've been at churches where recent converts were more of an elder than the elders who were there. It was a popularity contest. It was whoever wanted to be an elder. I'm a little weary. If you really want to be an elder, I'm a little weary. You know, it's one of those, I feel God calling me to do this. I know that there's a, there's a burden on my heart for this church, and this is where, I, that I like. But when it's like, I want to be an elder, it's like, I don't know. That's scary. I've, I've, I've seen too many churches with elders who are dictators and not servants. And a church that has <coughs> dictating elders, I mean, it, they're going to die. Plain and simple. But church that has elders who are servants, I think, is going to be the, the, the foundation of, of what we see with the gospel. I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Rick Rigsby, who's, who's, whose father told him that, you know, if we're going to lead in any capacity, we need to make sure that our servant's tallow is bigger than our ego. And I wholeheartedly agree. That servant's towel needs to be a whole lot bigger than our ego. Now we come to a text that, well, I'll explain in a moment. It's not problematic, but there's, there's, issue, there's things that we need to cover with it. So we're looking at John chapter 8, and we're looking at verses 1 through 11. Do I have somebody who's willing to read all that? Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group, and Jesus and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go walk away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still sitting there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. All right. Time to teach. Do any of your Bibles have brackets around that? Yeah. All right. Does anybody know what that's a sign of? This says earliest manuscripts do not include this. Okay. So the earliest manuscripts do not have this in it. Uh, we see it arise later. Is that a problem? Maybe. What do you think? Okay. Could be a problem for like context of the story, but I mean, no. So the reason why I don't I don't see it as a as a, as a problem, and, and we'll explain why. And and, and that's first, uh, why do we know that this is not in the original of the Gospel of John? Huh? And well, we know that it's not what we know it's not in the earlier manuscripts at least, but the original uh, we don't. Uh, but the, at least the copies of the earlier manuscripts, we are not seeing it, it, it come up, right? Uh, we need to look at two areas, and, and I think that, that John MacArthur does a good job explaining this. We need to look at the internal and the external evidence. So the internal evidence. The text itself kind of disrupts the story taking place in the Gospel of John. And, and I say that because if we, when we get to verse 12... We know that Jesus, just before this, alluded to the water ceremony, right? Where he said, come and drink and you will not be thirsty and spring of living water. Will pour. Well, verse 12, he alludes to a second ceremony of the lighting ceremony. And so you have this 
story just kind of thrown in the middle, which kind of separates two very similar events that would have happened in, in order. Now, to be fair, this entire chapter of John uh, is only found in the Gospel of John, but it's only verses 1 through 11 that are really in question because of the earlier manuscripts. Um, we see this interruption even more uh, when we look at what Jesus is talking about in John 8, 12 through 14. So then Jesus again spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have uh, the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered them and said, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I came from and where I am going. Did Jesus say anything like that prior? Yes. We just cut, we, something we just read and just covered. So you can see how the flow of the latter part of chapter 7 would tie in very well to verse 12. How that would continue. So it seems like this is just kind of thrown in there. Uh, Jesus is addressing the very objections made in the previous chapter. And so the story just kind of interrupts it. We also see that in this story, um, in other manuscripts, it's placed elsewhere in the Gospel of John, and it's also placed once in the Gospel of Luke. So we see this story not in 8, 1 through 11. We see it elsewhere in the Gospel of John and of other manuscripts. And then one, and in others, we can see it in just the Gospel of Luke. So the problem with that, I, I agree with Dr. James White, and that's such a moving about by a body of text is a plain evidence that it is, a, it is of later origin and the attempt on the part of the scribes to find a place where it fits. So that is, an, that is another evidence that this isn't something that was original to, to the text per se. Okay? Now the external evidence. The earliest manuscripts from other translations of other languages also omit this. So the Bible is being translated, not just in Greek, but it would be translated in other languages by other scribes. Um, and they even left it out. And none of the early church fathers who wrote in Greek ever commentated on the text. There's speculation, most notably by Augustine, who believe that this, it may have been removed due to what appears to be Jesus' lenient response to uh, adultery. But I don't think that that necessarily adds up. Uh, also, Jesus interacts with other people in merciful ways. What other woman did Jesus interact with in a very merciful and compassionate way? The well. Mary Okay, and, and all, but the woman at the well, you know, really jumps out, right? Uh, so it's not that he has these lenient. It's like always oh, being too lenient. We see him interact with other women in great compassion and mercy. So why weren't those kind of pulled out? If that's kind of the theory, right? It's, you're being too lenient, Jesus, so we take it out. Well, there's a lot of places it seems like Jesus is too lenient, yet we, we kept those in. So that's why I don't, I don't think it's, it's consistent. When you say this, J.R., was it just relative to this passage in John, or did it also talk a lot about the end of Mark? Stuff. It did mention the end of Mark, which which that's about the and they can they would drink poison or whatnot. Yeah, it's pretty much people. everything from they're startled at the tomb until all the way through the end where you get yeah the they made great commission and yeah yeah, yeah they made mention of they made mention of Mark, but I didn't okay. I didn't I just I didn't know if you looked at that. No. I didn't go in detail of Mark, but no, they, they you can read Mark if you read Mark and that just don't fit. It's like the language and stuff is totally. No, and, and there, it was interesting because there was a debate with, with Jeff Durbin and James White with, with these other guys, and this dude was nuts. Uh, but he brought out antifreeze and was challenging people to drink it because of that scripture. And Dr. White was kind of like, that's not even in the earliest manuscripts. Why would we? <laughs> and so it was just one of those, one of those things. But yeah, the dude was nuts. Uh, but anyway, so church fathers, you know, they're not really addressed. However, I do want to say this. That doesn't mean that we think that this is just throw it out, per se. Uh, John Westcott, or John Westcott, uh, he says that the text is beyond doubt an authentic fragment of apostolic tradition, meaning that though John didn't write it, 
There was a strong apostolic oral tradition that would have passed these stories along. For example, just because it wasn't written doesn't mean that those who had testimonies of their interactions with Jesus were not also taken in by the church. And also, for example, my testimony of my interaction with Jesus and his salvation is different from yours. However, it attests to who he is. Other people who have joined the church would have their testimony. Perhaps this woman joined the church and had her testimony, and she testified of it, and it, there was a strong oral tradition that this woman had this happen. But the question then becomes is, well, where would it, would it go? It, so it's, it's not a matter of, I think, that this has no validity whatsoever. I think we can see that there's going to probably be a very strong oral tradition that is backed based on the testimony of those who had interactions with Jesus, perhaps from this woman in particular, but it was not in John's inspired writing. It, it also could have been written somewhere else, and they didn't want to lose it as we consolidated the Bible. Yeah. You know, and so it's in this other sayings of Jesus or something like that, and this doesn't make the doesn't make the the cut, so to speak, and so, you know, we want to make sure we retain this really, really great story of of who Jesus is too. So. And and that builds off of, of, of kind of where, where we're gonna go with it. Does that mean that we just write this off and let that be it? No. Well, what, what do we also see in the text? We know that it doesn't compromise who Jesus is. It doesn't compromise his character nature. Unlike if you read the Gospel of Judas, there's some pretty weird stories in there that's like, that didn't happen. So, so this story does not compromise the character nature of Jesus Christ. It, it doesn't introduce any new doctrines. So it is something that we can read and glean truth from, but I would say as a church, it's not something that we then create a church practice or build any doctrine off of. The same with the passage in Mark. If it's not in the earliest manuscripts, you do, you do not take those and go, well, let's build a doctrine off of this. Let's make this essential to our church functioning. You just don't do that. And so that's what we, that's what we are not going to do. But it doesn't mean we can't read it and glean from it, assuming that it is an oral tradition, and seeing that this does portray a consistent image of Jesus. So let's go ahead and do that. Verses 3 through 5, would somebody be willing to reread those? The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? It, it's, it's What pops in my mind, because I don't trust the Pharisees, how do they know she was caught in adultery? It could very well be that her husband brought her. But I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. I'm wondering if it's a Pharisee who was having an affair and then just brought her in. I, don't, I have no clue. We have no clue. He didn't care. He was just going to treat her as a sinner. Yeah, but I, 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 mean, I, don't, I don't know how the, it became aware that she was, in a, but she certainly didn't defend herself. Or they could have known that Jesus wasn't going to say anything about, you know, going to condemn her to death, and they probably paid her. That's a possibility. So we don't know where she came from. There's, there's, there, but I do think that, I do think the text though does communicate that she was an adulteress uh, because of Jesus's interaction with her. But well, she didn't run. She, she. No. She stayed. She knew she was wrong. And I can't imagine how terrifying that would be. She was probably surrounded by a bunch of men who wanted to kill her. Um, it, a lot of us can be a deer in the headlights in those situations because that's an awful lot going on at the same time. Um, and now they're being brought and she's placed before someone who you know, might be the only person to show her mercy. You have no idea. Uh, verses 6 through 8. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So we have no idea what Jesus was writing. We have no idea what Jesus is writing. Uh, probably the most interesting speculation that I've heard, which I really like, um, which would be really cool is that he's writing on the ground uh, the sins of those 
around him. That those who would be picking up rock. He's, he's right, not writing, Jeff, you did this. But writing, you know, writing sins down on the ground. And then he says, if you're without it and you're seeing your sin written on the ground. I thought that would be pretty cool. I don't know. It's one of those things we're going to go, hey, Jesus, what were you drawing? And so help me if he's like, oh, I, was, I was drawing stick figures. <laughs> you know, drunk, yeah. I was just doodling. <laughs> yeah, I was playing tic tac toe against the father, and I won. Yeah. But we really don't know what he wrote. But that's one of those speculations I heard, which would be really cool if it's true. Uh, so anyway, we, but we really don't know what Jesus was writing. But he does say after you know, he writes, and he says, "You who are without sin, cast the first stone." And then he begins to write some more. In, in verse nine, it tells us that. What we're seeing is the oldest to the youngest, that the oldest should have the self-awareness and maturity to recognize that they are not without sin. Mm -hmm. And so the oldest would walk away first. That would be an example to the younger, and the younger would then take part in that same process of self-examination and, and, and walking away. This is why it's important, and this is why I keep you know, saying to you, if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm old and I'm in the church, you're still not done. There's still plenty of examples, especially if our desire is to have younger families come to our church. You set an example for them that they would follow, and this would be a good example of that, where at least the older have the self-awareness to recognize, I've got sin. And so they left down to the youngest. I'm surprised that any scribe or Pharisee would acknowledge their sin publicly. I... It, well, the text, I mean, the text just says older to the youngest. It could just be the people. And then the Pharisees were like, um, well, we're leaving. You know, we're trying to trap them, and Jesus throws us a curveball, and now everyone's gone. Well, this is pointless. I don't know. Maybe they slipped out with the crowd or, or what, but you're right. I wouldn't foresee the Pharisees having that self awareness. I, I really wouldn't. Verses 10 through 11. Somebody read those real quick. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she says. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So we see this interaction, and it's pretty parallel to the woman at the well. The difference is, is Jesus doesn't have to reveal this woman's sin to her. It's already made public. He doesn't have to prove that I know your sin, like he did at the woman at the well. It's her sin is being shut from the, the rooftop. Everybody knows it. Uh, so that's different. Something I do think we need to note is that Jesus asked, did no one condemn you? And then he says, from now on, do not sin any longer. Jesus judged her, and he judged her sin to be bad. That's why he tells her to stop. But he does not condemn her. He does not leave her in her sin to die and to be damned. He calls her out of her sin. And I think sometimes we need to be reminded of that as well. When we're feeling trapped and we're feeling bombarded, that, that Christ has come to call us out of our sin. Not that we would be ensnared and entrapped continuing in it. Though we do know that we are going to fight sin every day of our life until, uh, until the perfect comes. And, and you know what? To be honest with you, that's a fight worth having. It's worth waking up and fighting those sins. It's worth waking up and facing addiction. It's worth waking up and dealing with that every single day because it's better than giving in to it. It's better than serving that kingdom rather than Christ. And Christ is calling her out of that life. Um, and, and, and him calling her out of that life, this is what it would mean for her. If she could not reconcile to her husband, then it would mean... If he divorced her, it would be a biblical divorce. She had an affair. But it would call her to celibacy. Because for her to remarry would be, according to other Jesus' teachings, adultery. That because you committed an affair, you have committed adultery. And if your spouse chooses to, to divorce you, not only is it biblical for them to do so, but for you to then remarry would be adultery yet again. And it's a hard teaching. It was funny because when... When you guys asked me the difficult question on what does the Bible say about divorce, thanks for that. I was going out of town on that Sunday, and I asked, um, God, this how am I forgetting his name? He was the interim minister. 
Drew, Drew. Drew. I go, Drew, I'm preaching on this. You can continue the series. And I told him what it was. He goes, now I'll let you do it. <laughs> he goes, now I'll let you do that one. But, but yeah, we talked about the three biblical means for divorce. But it also says that if you were the one who committed adultery, so Jesus would be calling her out of this to go stop it. This relationship with this other man is to be cut off. And if your husband doesn't reconcile to you, calling her out of her sin would mean that she would have to commit to a life of not being remarried. Our sins affect us. Now, that's not popular. Now, one of the things we can do as Christians is, is really cool, and that is don't commit adultery, and you don't have to worry about that situation. Fair enough? I think it's pretty, pretty easy. You know, but he does call her out of her sin. So he does judge her, but he does not condemn her. And I think that that's important. So she's told to come out and not to go back to it. All right, are there any blanks that you did not get? How are you doing, James? All right. All right, so... If you guys got all the blanks, fantastic. So again, I want to go back and reiterate, just because we're looking at a text, for example, 1 through 11, doesn't mean that there's not truth to glean from it. It's just something that we would not build a doctrine off of. Okay. Though I do think it's a good example, and I do think it gives us another image of, of Christ, especially if it is a trusted oral tradition put in writing. I think that, that is, uh, that's very interesting. So, all right. Randy, would you mind closing us in prayer? Yep. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this time that we could come together and, and, and study your word and, and see Jesus come alive and, and to see who he is, that um, he is both merciful and that he is judge, but he is also Savior. And Lord, uh, um, I ask that you be with each of us as we as we go go into the world over the next few days and Lord, bring us back together on Sunday as we, we celebrate the, the resurrection of your Son. And, um, just, uh, God, we give thanks for the life that we have in him. All these things we pray in his name. Amen. Amen.